Welcome back. We're here in chapter 26, slide 26. Um, we have gone through the, uh, from the oral cavity, salivary glands secreted into the oral cavity, gone down the esophagus to the stomach. Um, and this is where we're now. We've gone from the stomach past the pyloric sphincter. Whoops. Pyloric sphincter, and we're entering the small intestines. The small intestines can be divided into three parts. The first part is called the duodenum. And the duodenum is the shortest C-shaped section. I'm tracing it at the bottom right. This is the duodenum. It's short, it's C-shaped, it's also uh, retroperitoneal unlike the stomach, unlike the other parts of the small intestines. In general, the small intestines is long. So small is not referring to its length, it's referring to its diameter. Uh, and by having a small diameter and lots of uh, folds, which we'll talk about here in a second, it maximizes surface area for digestion and absorption. We didn't, we got lots of digestion in the stomach, the stomach is not adapted for absorption. The small intestines is adapted for absorption. I'll repeat that. The stomach is adapted for storage and digestion. It is not adapted for absorption. We absorb nutrients in the small intestines. To that end, what do we have in, in terms of tissue? Uh, we have simple columnar epithelium with microvilli. The microvilli further maximize the surface area. Uh, you can barely, in this uh, histology at the bottom left, you can't see the lumen very well, but the lumen side is over on, uh, on the uh, above my black line. <clears throat> on top of that, you have texture. Uh, as you can see here, there's texture in the epithelium. These are called villi. And then a single simple columnar cell. I'm tracing, let me trace it a different smaller thing. These simple columnar cells have microvilli. That are really small to maximize surface area. So the microvilli don't move like cilia. They're there to just help maximize surface area for secretion and absorption. <clears throat> the duodenum is a unique place. You're getting chyme. You're getting chyme from the stomach going through the pyloric sphincter. We'll talk about what this is in a second, but you're getting bile from the gallbladder. And you're also getting digestive enzymes from the pancreas. Pancreas is hiding uh, behind the stomach in this picture. So you're getting three different substances entering the duodenum. It's, it's an important intersection. Chyme, acidic food, uh, bile, and pancreatic juices, pancreatic uh, digestive enzymes. Um, so to protect itself, the duodenum needs to produce a high amount of mucus and buffers. Remember buffers, we have buffers in our saliva, we have buffers here too, to help mitigate the acid. Um, what's producing the mucus, in the, in the stomach we had mucus cells. In, in the, uh, in the small intestines, like the duodenum, we have goblet cells. You can see those light colored goblet cells sporadically here and there. Here, 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 here. These are all goblet cells. <clears throat> We're gonna be looking at different sections of small intestine. They all look very similar. So you have to look for very small differences. Um, let me uh, clear my drawings. 
let's look at this histology more closely. So th these are, this is the, um, how, how do I call this? This is the simple columnar epithelium. as well as the lamina propria. The lamina propria surrounds the villi. So let me trace a single villus again. Where I'm gonna color in in green, that's lamina propria. <clears throat> you have muscularis mucosa, which is already labeled. So I'm just gonna highlight it. In yellow. This is the thin layer of smooth muscle to help push on the glands, muscularis mucosa. But then in the submucosa, we have something really interesting. In the submucosa, we have lots of these light colored rounded glands with cuboidal cells. I'm not gonna go in depth about what these do, but the presence of these submucosal glands is indicative that we're in the duodenum. We're not gonna see the same amount, the same quantity of these rounded submucosal glands in the jejunum or ileum. We see tons of them these rounded glands of the submucosa in the duodenum. So that is a, an important thing to look for. <clears throat> now we've mentioned bile. Bile is produced by the liver. Take a look at the top right. You can see our liver right here. Bile is produced and it's actually stored. We, we have a storage area of bile that's the gallbladder. So let's talk about the liver first and then we'll talk about the gallbladder. Bile and why we're talking about bile, bile is a substance that's secreted into the duodenum. Why do we need bile in the duodenum? Bile helps with digestion, specifically helps with digestion of fats. Helps with digestion of fats. This animation over here, this is showing a lipid. Let me use a different color. You've seen fats before. If you've ever played around with oil, for instance, oil is a lipid. Um, when you mix oil with water, the oil wants to separate. Even if you shake up the oil water mixture and form bubbles of oil, those droplets of oil will want to merge back together and give it enough time, you'll get that full separation. So naturally, if you have lipids next to each other, they'll merge together. The more clumped up lipids are, the harder it is to digest. You're not maximizing surface area. The whole point of digestion is to break things down. We wanna separate things and keep them apart but lipids naturally want to come back together. So how do we minimize that? What we can do is we can cover up we can cover up this lipid droplet with bile. Bile is a special chemical that can cover up lipids like this. How uh, we can talk about that separately uh, privately because it's It'll take time, um, but it has that special property that can cover up lipid droplets and therefore prevent other lipid droplets from merging with it. You keep the fat separated from each other. The word for this, so, so let me, let me uh, clarify, we're not actually breaking down the fat. That's the job of enzymes, enzymes, can help break things down like lipids. We're keeping fat separated. The word for this is emulsification. Emulsification. When you get milk from the store, milk that has fat in it, so like 2% or whole milk, the fat has been emulsified. Normally, if you let the fat sit, 
the fat rises to the top and you get that layer of fat. If you ever cook, cooked any food with a decent amount of fat, you'll see that in your leftovers. That's completely normal. The emulsification makes sure that it's all spread throughout. <clears throat> Bile helps with emulsification, which helps with digestion. It makes it easier for enzymes to come in and break the smaller droplets of fat than larger ones. All right. <laughs> the cells that are producing uh, the bile are hepatocytes. Hepato means liver. Cells of the liver, hepatocytes. And when you look at cells of the liver, they're organized into these lobules, these hexagonal lobules. You can see that I've traced over one lobule. And then a single hepatocyte, I'm tracing, I'm tracing the simple cuboidal cells and they're arranged like spokes in a wheel towards the center. <clears throat> when they secrete bile, they secrete into ducts and those ducts lead to bile ducts that are at the corners. There are bile ducts at the corners of each, uh, of each lobule. So for example, uh, here is, take a look at the bottom right. Here is a hepatocyte. And it produces bile into bile duct. And that bile duct can either go directly to the duodenum or we can store excess in the gallbladder. <clears throat> so that's the function of bile, helping emulsify fats, making it easier to digest food that has fat in it, lipids. Um, more about hepatocytes and the liver as a whole. Uh, hepatocytes not only produce bile, they have many other functions, including uh, they store nutrients, they help detoxify blood from anything that we might have eaten that's toxic to us, like poisons um, or alcohol. Uh, it does this before it enters the rest of our systemic circulation. If you recall, whenever we absorb something from, uh, our, from our intestines, it goes through our hepatic portal vein, to the liver sinusoid capillaries, where we can, the hepatocytes can take in what we've uh, eaten and screen it, so to speak, and then release it to the rest of the systemic circulation. <clears throat> the liver as a whole has four lobes. It's a pretty large organ. It's the largest one in your abdominal pelvic region, uh, in your abdominal pelvic cavity. Uh, you have a leftmost lobe. Uh, this is the piece of liver that you could donate if you need to donate. The liver can regenerate pretty, pretty well. Uh, you have a large right lobe. So those are the two largest lobes. This is from an anterior view. When you look from an inferior view, uh, here's the posterior side. So this side is anterior. Uh, you've got a caudate lobe, which is close to the inferior vena cava. Here's the inferior vena cava. And then next to the uh, gallbladder, next to the gallbladder, you have a quadrate lobe. Left lobe, right lobe, caudate is behind posterior, cauda means tail, it's behind, quadrate is the other one. <clears throat> the left and right, um, The left and right lobes are separated by something called the falciform ligament. The left and right lobes are, are separated by connective tissue called the falciform ligament. It's not a true ligament, it's not connecting bone. It's called the falciform ligament. This falciform ligament has a piece that extends anteriorly. Let me color it in here in green. has a piece that extends anteriorly. This is called the round ligament or in Latin, ligamentum teres. 
What the ligamentum teres is, it's a remnant of our fetal circulation. If you recall, the umbilical vein went straight to the liver, where then you could have that ductus venosus. Ligament, ligamentum teres is, it used to be the umbilical vein. So this ligamentum teres connects to the inside of where your belly button is, where your umbilicus, where your umbilicus is. <clears throat> it doesn't have any function. It just kind of secures the liver in place, but it doesn't, it doesn't need much securing. Looking at uh, liver histology, once again, it's arranged in lobules. They're mostly hexagonal. It's not always perfect, but let me try to draw one. Uh, take a look at the top left. You can see that there is a corner right here. There's another corner here. It looks like this one has five sides. There's another one. So here are some lobules. They're mostly hexagonal shaped. I mentioned how the hepatocytes are radiating towards the center. There's a reason for that. Uh, you have bile ducts on the corners, but in the center, you have a vein. This is a central vein. Um, and the central vein is what's going to drain to the hepatic vein, which goes to the inferior vena cable. Let me go back. So branches of central veins go to the hepatic vein from all these lobules. At the corners, at these corners, what you have are something called a portal triad. We have something called a portal triad. A portal triad is a bile duct. A bile duct is simple or maybe stratified cuboidal. You can see these cuboidal cells here, you can um, smush together around a lumen. So that's a bile duct. You have a hepatic artery, a branch of the hepatic artery. You can see the smooth muscle lining this and how much thicker it is compared to this other blood vessel. There's a larger blood vessel, but a thinner wall. This is a branch of a portal vein, hepatic portal vein. This is the vein, portal vein coming from the intestines, the blood coming from the intestines. Hepatic portal vein differs from hepatic vein. Hepatic vein is in the center, hepatic portal vein branch is at the corners because that's bringing blood in. Both hepatic artery and hepatic portal vein are bringing blood into the liver. You can see the sinusoid capillaries. The sinusoid capillaries are these little gaps that are leading towards the hepatic portal vein. <clears throat> so a lot going on in the liver. It's a super important area. We have these repeating uh, hepatic lobules with hepatocytes and sinusoid cap uh, blood coming into the liver comes from hepatic portal vein and hepatic artery. We go through sinusoid capillaries. We can get ex lots of exchange thanks to those large gaps in the capillaries and we drain out the, that central vein, which is a branch to, which branches to the hepatic vein, to the inferior vena cava. <clears throat> so the liver and gallbladder, those are accessory organs leading into the duodenum. The pancreas is also an accessory organ leading into the duodenum. We've talked about the pancreas being an endocrine organ, it is that, it secretes insulin and glucagon. It's also an exocrine organ. It secretes digestive enzymes into a lumen, uh, into a tract, specifically the duodenum. So here in the pancreas, we secrete out 
Um, you can see that the pancreas has uh, a particular shape to it. There's a tail end right here. There's a head end that's a bit larger. It's kind of nestling into that C shape of the duodenum. Um, in terms of histology, these circular shapes of cuboidal cells, those are acini, pancreatic acini. And it, in our histology, it's the darker ones. It's the ones I told you to kind of ignore before, but now we're paying attention to them. These pancreatic acini are the ones secreting the di digestive pancreatic juices to help you further digest the chyme that you brought in from the stomach. What's really interesting is that the pathway that pancreatic juice takes into the duodenum is the, the same path or come, becomes the same path that bile takes to get into the duodenum. There's a hole called the sphincter of Adai that both pancreatic juices and bile come out. They come out of the same hole. So they're regulated by the same sphincter. And in general, when you eat food, you want to release both because you're probably eating something that has some fat in it and other things like proteins and carbohydrates. Hopefully you're eating a somewhat balanced meal. I want to clarify again, acini are the darker ones here and they're relatively small. That's very different from the islets, the pancreatic islets, which are larger and lighter colored. <clears throat> that was the duodenum and the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Once food go, gets past the duodenum, we've, we've done a lot of digestion in the duodenum. Now at this point, we want to absorb as many nutrients as possible. The most digestion and absorption occurs in this middle portion of the small intestines, the jejunum. Uh, in our Diagram over here, it's the one in yellow. To maximize digestion and absorption, we need prominent folds. So there are pleaky, remember pleaky are circular folds and villi are the finger like folds. You can see pleaky with your own eyes. They are a gross anatomy structure. So when we're looking at this picture that I've just circled in blue, this, what I've traced it in blue, that's a pleca. It's these circular folds that I'm now tracing in this tube. It's these circular folds that you can see with your own eyes, they're very large. But then microscopically, microscopically, you can see these tiny, tiny things, those are villi. And then recall that on villi, you have microvilli. So there's magnitudes of maximizing surface area, pleaky, villi, and microvilli. Not only do we have extensions going up into the lumen, but we have things that dip down deeper. <laughs> they dip deeper in. These are called crypts, crypts. A crypt is where you bury someone that goes underneath a crypt. Uh, these produce hormones. You'll learn about hormones that coordinate digestion in physiology, but there are other hormones that we have not discussed. There's also many cells here that can undergo mitosis for replacing epithelium and also mucus production. You're going to find lots of goblet cells here as well. Note, we have the same uh, layers. You've got your mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and this one is intraperitoneal. Oops. The jejunum is intraperitoneal, so the outermost layer is serous membrane, it's serosa. It's the peritoneal, visceral peritoneum. <clears throat> when you look at the histology of the jejunum, two th really the one thing to look for are large, high magnitude pleaky. We're very zoomed out here compared to what we saw before. What I just traced in, in green are pleaky. A single villus here in blue, that's a villus, that's a villus. The villi are smaller. 
So really large, prominent cliquey in the jejunum because we wanna maximize absorption of nutrients. When you look microscopic or in higher, higher magnification, <clears throat> so take a look at the bottom right, you can see a single villus. And let me do this in green. You can see a single villus right here and then the microvilli are along this border. Very, very small and fuzzy because the resolution isn't great here. <clears throat> Recall that the blood vessels that come into these villi and pleaky, recall that the blood vessels are, have we branched to fenestrated capillaries, not continuous, not sinusoids, fenestrated, larger pores to absorb nutrients. But on top of that, not only do we have um, fenestrated capillaries, we also have something called lacteals. Lacteals are lymph capillaries that absorb lipids. Lipids we don't want just floating around in our blood. It can cause problems because of it, how it interacts with other things. It can like clump up as we've discussed. So we want to carry it separately. Um, another thing you'll talk more about in physio. So we have lacteals, lymph capillaries, special lymph capillaries for absorbing lipid nutrients. We've gone from the duodenum to the jejunum, and now here's the last part of the small intestines, the ileum. The ileum we've seen before because it has lymphatic tissue, these Peyer's patches, these lymphoid nodules that contain lots of lymphocytes and macrophages, and it's found in the submucosa. It does have pleaky, it does have villi, but they're not as dramatic. You can see the villi here. You don't really see large pleaky extending up like what we saw in the jejunum, but occasionally you might see something bulge up a little bit. But you see villi here facing the lumen. Still simple columnar, uh, still simple columnar epithelium with microvilli. That's what we have in all of the small intestines as well as the large intestines. Simple columnar epithelium microvilli plus goblet cells throughout producing mucus. The ileum is also intraperitoneal. So the outermost layer, whoops, the outermost layer is serosa. <clears throat> All right, that wraps up the small intestines. A lot of information there, small intestines as well as accessory organs, pancreas, liver, gallbladder. In the next final video, we will talk about uh, um, large intestines, rectum, uh, and what happens in those places. So I'll see you in the next video. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Take care.